Hello, hello, hello. This is Mr. Math, your chess instructor. Last video, we went over basic tactics, and this video is going to be on opening principles. The game of chess can be split up into the opening, the middle game, and the end game. The opening being the first few moves, the middle game being, of course, the middle, and the end game being when most pieces have been traded off, and, of course, near the end of the game. We'll be starting with openings on this channel, as it's very important to have a good foundation, to have a good first few moves of the game, to properly be able to set up for a successful middle game, and eventually a successful end game, or simply just winning before you even get there. But first, let's go over the puzzle from last week. So, if you recall, last week's puzzle was the following position. This position, with these pieces on these squares, is a very well-known draw, but move the king ever so slightly to this square instead, and it's a win for white, using one of the five tactics we discussed last week, those tactics being pins, forks, skewers, discovers, uh, discoveries, and x-rays. Let's take a look at why white is winning in this position. Recall white's main methods of trying to get the pawn to the queening square. The rook's in the way, if the rook moves away, then black can capture the pawn, and of course that's a draw. If the king tries to defend this pawn, black can check it infinitely. And if white's king attempts to attack black's rook, black can keep it on the A file by moving it up and down and up and down. Additionally, if white attempts a check, and then uses that free tempo a move to make a queen, Black can still capture the queen, and so white does not win. So, what is the difference between this position and this position? Well, it turns out that when this king moves forward, uh, or moves to the side and toward this pawn, just one square, it now is no longer defending this side of the row. And you'll notice that the king and the pawn are on the same rank. As a result, white now has a brilliant way to create a skewer threat to enable promotion, and that is rook to h8. Let's take a look at why this works. Firstly, the threat. With rook to h8, white is threatening to move the pawn to a8. Previously, rook moves didn't work because black could simply capture the pawn. But now that black's king has stepped one square to the left, we now see that white can, has a skewer available to win the game, and that's rook h7. So good job if you found that. That's the solution to the puzzle. White's rook can go to h8 and to h7 to set up a skewer. Of course, now when the king moves, white's rook can capture black's rook, and that's game. Of course, it's not entirely clear whether or not white is winning. Still, because black can throw in a couple other moves. For example, rook a2 check attacking the white king. And you might be wondering, didn't we already establish that black can simply check the white king over and over again? Well, now this time there's a clear difference. Before, when black was checking the white king, the white king was here, and black could check this way, and the king had no escape square. This time, however, because white's king is guarding the g1 square, black's only option for a check is rook a2, and white can simply march the king over to the b7 square. So king f3, rook a3, king four, rook a4, king d5, rook a5, king d6, rook a6, and now after king b7, promotion is now inevitable, and the king, of course, protects the pawn, so black cannot capture without losing their rook. Once again, great job if you found the winning idea, which was a skewer via rook to h8. Now let's move on to the lesson. All right, now we'll move on to opening principles. Our first principle is that we need to accomplish three goals. Both in chess and in life, it's important to set goals so that you know where you're going and what your plan should be. In this case, our three goals for the opening are as follows. Firstly, control a center. For the purposes of the opening, we'll be defining the center as these four squares that are directly adjacent to the central point. 
So that's the square e4, e5, d4, and d5. During the opening, you should seek to obtain control of two of these squares as white and at least one and a half of these squares as black. By control, I mean that you have more pieces on or attacking that square than your opponents. If you have the same number of pieces attacking or on that square, it's a tie. Our second goal is developing our pieces. By developing, we mean bring them to more active squares. For example, our knights can be developed on the first move if we so choose, since they hop in an L shape, to F3 and C3. Our pawns will move up in the center, our bishops will come out toward the center, our queen and rooks will also come to the center. Finally, our last goal is to castle our king. You might remember the special move of castling, which is only allowed if neither the king nor the rook have made a move yet, and the king is not under attack, going to be going through attack, or resulting in attack. So in this position, for example, let's just say the bishop has come out, the knight has come out, and of course there's no peace now between the king and the rook. I can castle by moving the king two squares to the right and sliding the rook to the other side. If you need a refresher on how castling works, you can go back to Peace Movement, which was the first video on this on chess on this channel. Now let's see those principles in action. The position where we've accomplished all three of those goals to the best of our capability in as little time as possible is known as the perfect position, and I'll show you it now. We'll do this assuming that black does absolutely nothing and let's say shuffles their knight back and forth. So we have infinite moves. We'll start by moving our pawns forward to e4 and to d4. These are central pawns and the only pawns which can advance directly into one of the four center squares. Additionally, they also cover the central squares of our opponent. Next are our knights. Our knights can choose to hop slightly forward, forward and toward the center, or forward and away from the center. It's most optimal to hop as close to the center as possible, and so we'll move it here from g1 to f3 for the knight on the king side, and b1 to c3 for the knight on the queen side. Next are our bishops. Again, we'll move them as close to the center as possible. In this case, that's bishop to c4 for the light squared bishop, bishop to f4 for the dark squared bishop. Our queen is going to move up one square to either d2 or e2, either one is fine. And finally, we're going to castle in either direction. We'll do king side. And in doing so, we now enable both of our rooks to be able to move to the center. So we'll do it one step at a time. Our rook on the queen side goes to the d file. Our rook on the king side goes to the e file. Note that if you had castled queen side, the rook would have been already on the d file. So you would have already completed that step. And here we have it. This is known as the perfect position from the opening. Let's take a look at all of our three goals and see just how well we've achieved them. Firstly, control of the center. Well, we certainly have that. We have our two pawns in d4 and e4, and therefore we control those two central squares. And if we look at the pieces attacking d5 and e5, we count one, two, three on each side for us. And of course, we also count zero from our opponents. Therefore, we control all four center squares, and that's goal number one complete. Secondly, have we developed our pieces? Well, yes, our knights and bishops have come out uh, toward the center. Our queen is off the back rank, and our rooks are in the center. Finally, have we gotten our king to safety? Via castling, and yes, our king is now on g1 because it is castled and is safely tucked behind a wall of pawns. Okay, now that we've gone over the perfect position and how it accomplishes the three principles or goals that we set out to accomplish in the opening, let's try a more practical example. This time, 
black will also be making moves and they'll be doing their best to also accomplish the perfect position. And we're going to have to adapt because, of course, when our opponent is moving, they'll also be fighting for control of the center, they'll also be developing their own pieces, and they'll also be castling their king, and some of those actions will disrupt our attempts to attain the perfect position. This time, let's have white start with the move d4, and now black will play the move d5. If you recall, our next move would have been to play the move pawn to e4. Our first puzzle is, do you think this is still a good idea? Why or why not? If it isn't, what alternative would you suggest? And if it is, why is it still good? Pause the video if you need to, take your time, and think. Alright, hopefully you've had enough time after pausing the video and determined that moving the pawn to e4 would not be a very good idea anymore. Although this would have been optimal under the perfect position, we can't do that safely here, because after they move pawn to e4, our opponent's pawn on d5 can capture diagonally, and therefore can capture our pawn, and since we have nothing defending it, it will be captured for free. If that was the conclusion you arrived at, hopefully you also found an alternative. You might have thought that we can also move our pawn to e3, but it's important here to think about what we, our plans are going forward. Remember that one of our other goals is to develop our pieces, and our pieces include the bishop. The bishop on c1 would be blocked by our pawn on e3 should we choose to move the pawn to e3. And so hopefully you arrived at the conclusion that we shouldn't move this pawn yet. Instead, we should move our other pieces first. And the correct answers would have been to move the knight to f3, the knight to c3, or the bishop to f4. Let's start with bishop to f4. Now, let's continue with the rest of the opening moves. Black develops, and so do we. Now that our bishop is out, we can freely move our pawn forward without blocking it, and so we do so. Our opponent can do the same. And both sides will continue developing all of their pieces out. Of course, we can't move our bishop to the c4 square, so we'll move it to an alternative, which would be one of these three squares. All would be acceptable here. And now we'll stop here. With our opponent's last move, pawn to c5, they attack our pawn on d4, however, it's firmly guarded. That said, black's recently gained a lot of space on the queen side. Now, all of our pieces are out. And our final goal that we have not achieved is castling our king. The question now is, which side do you think it should castle to? Based on black's last move. Pause the video, take time if you need to, and unpause when you're ready. Okay, recall that the purpose of castling our king is to tuck it away to safety. Castling queenside would temporarily keep it safe behind the wall of pawns, but also opens it up to attack. Our opponent now has a myriad of options. Since they have more space on the queen side, they can now play, for example, pawn takes d4, open up a half open file for a rook to go onto. The queen has very easy access to the queen side. Their bishop can move in for a pin, and their other bishop is already attacking one of our vulnerable pawns. As a result, this castle won't be safe in the long term. Instead, if our primary goal is king safety, it is better to castle on the king side. Black doesn't have as much space gained here. The bishop does not have an easy way to access the king side, nor does the queen, and our opponent's bishop is pointing the wrong way. All right. Now let's complete the rest of the moves of the opening. Black also castles, and we move our rooks to the center, as does black. Now let's take a look at how well we've accomplished our objectives. First, starting with central control. Remember as white, we need to control at least two of the squares in the center. Okay, now that all the moves for the opening have been made, Let's evaluate and see how well we did to accomplish all of our goals. Firstly, central control. 
recall that these four squares are the center. Let's make sure that as white, we've controlled at least two of these squares. Let's start with e4. Our opponent is attacking e4 once, twice, three times, and we only attack it once. Recall that pawns only capture diagonally and not forward, and so we only attack it once, and that's with our knight. So our opponent controls e4. How about d4? We have a piece on it, and we also attack it once, twice, three times, and arguably a fourth time via an x-ray with the rook. Finally, our opponents, or our uh, rather not finally, <laughs> our opponent is attacking the d4 square with only one piece. So we do control d4. Let's mark that with the red. Now let's look at d5. We attack it once. We don't attack it any more times. Again, pawns don't attack straight forward. They only attack diagonally. Whereas our opponent has a piece on it and also attacks it once, twice. As a result, our opponent controls the d5 square. Finally, we'll look at the e5 square. No one has a piece on it. We attack it once, twice, three times, and our opponent attacks it once. As a result, we also control the e5 square. And so we control two out of the four central squares and we've accomplished this goal. What about development? Well, that's pretty easy to see. All of our pieces that are worth three points, five points, and nine points are all out. Of course, our pawns are mostly still in the back rank, but that's fine since they're mostly serving structural and defensive purposes. Our main objective is to get our knights, bishops, queen, and rooks out to the center, and that we've accomplished. And finally, king safety. We've accomplished that because we opted to castle kingside here, and put it behind the safe wall of pawns in a spot where black is less able to attack us. So that's an example of a practical application of both the principles of the opening, as well as trying to get as close as possible to the perfect position. Now we'll move on to some things to avoid doing in the opening. Our first thing to avoid doing in the opening is making too many early queen moves. As a general rule, your queen should be one of the last pieces that you bring out, not one of the first. This might seem counterintuitive because it's the most powerful piece. However, because it's so powerful, it's also very valuable. That means whenever it's attacked, it can only ever retreat. It doesn't have the option to trade. Let's take a look at an early opening position that demonstrates why moving the queen too many times early on is too, very bad. We'll start with pawn to e4, black goes pawn to e5, and now white moves the queen on the second move with the move queen to h5. In doing so, white attacks the e5 pawn, black defends it while sticking to our chess principles and plays knight to c6, developing a piece and helping control the center. White now responds with bishop to c4, attacking black's pawn in f7. This is known as the, scholar, this is known as the scholar's mate line. Of course, the most natural move of knight f6 now loses to queen takes f7 checkmate. But of course, black is not going to play that. Black instead defends against the threat, pawn to g6, attacking white's queen. Of course, white cannot use their queen to trade for a pawn, as that would be a very unfavorable trade, and so they must retreat the queen. And now we see the problem with moving the queen out so early. It's going to be attacked a lot, and it's going to have to move around a lot. One option now is queen to f3, re-attacking the pawn on f7. But black can reply again, defending and continuing to follow the principles of chess, knight to f6, developing another piece, fighting for control of the center, preparing for castling. One particularly interesting line now goes pawn to g4 with the intent of attacking this knight. But now black can respy, reply with knight to d4, attacking white's queen. And now with white to move, one very interesting reply is queen to e3. And now with black, black can play knight takes c2 with a triple fork on the king, queen, and rook. So the main takeaway here, white's queen, because it was repeatedly attacked, was forced to move one, two, 
three times, wasting a lot of time, whereas Black was able to easily defend the threats while also adhering to the principles of chess, developing their pieces, controlling the center, and eventually getting an advantage via a tactic. Another thing to avoid doing in the opening is moving the same piece twice, especially when you're not doing it to react to a threat or to follow up with developing your other pieces. Once again, we'll show an example, starting with e4, black responds with e5, knight f3, knight c6, and bishop c4. So far, everything's gone to principle. Both sides are developing their pieces and controlling the center. However, black now violates the second rule and goes knight to d4, moving their knight twice in a row. To see why this is bad, white can simply stick and continue with their principles of chess, and now they can either move their pawn up, their knight up, or simply castle. Black doesn't have many options to do things with this knight besides capture the knight on f3, and now white can play queen takes f3. The end result of this position, white has already castled, brought out the bishop, and is preparing to bring out their other pieces, and has the queen with the mate threat in a position where it can't be very easily attacked because black's b8 knight is missing. Black, meanwhile, still has everything on the back rank. And we see why, once again, moving the same piece twice in the opening is not a good idea. Similarly to moving the queen out early, it causes a huge loss of time and allows our opponents to continue developing their pieces, controlling the center, and castling their king, whereas it stops us from doing so because we're spending extra moves to move the same piece multiple times. One final thing to avoid is pushing side pawns too frequently. Let's go back and take a look at another example. Once again, we'll start off with pawns e4 and e5, but this time white will lead with pawn to h4, pushing the pawn on the side. Notice that this move doesn't help accomplish any of white's objectives in controlling the center, nor does it help accomplish the development of white's pieces. Let's say black plays knight to c6, and white continues to push the pawn to h5, and now black plays the move pawn to d6. One potential justification for moving the side pawns is that some players may believe that they can develop their rooks early. However, when we develop a rook to the center, we're typically looking to castle and then move it to the central file since it's capable of moving vertically. It's far more risky to move it on the side of the board, and here we see why. White cannot move the rook to h3 without being captured by black's bishop, and it cannot move to h4 without being captured by black's queen. Its movement is quite limited. It also can't support a pawn push to h6, as black may simply capture the pawn with the knight, and white's rook is not willing to trade for a knight. Another situation where attacking with a side pawn may come up and may look good, but is not in reality, is when there's a pin on a knight. We'll use the following example. Pawn to e4, pawn to e5, knight to f3, knight to c6, bishop c4, bishop c5, d3, d6, knight c3, and now bishop to g4. In this position, white may attempt to kick this bishop away from the pin using the moves h3, and then following that up with g4. Black is then forced to retreat the bishop to g6. Although white looks like he may have gained some time by and forced the bishop off of a pin on the knight, in reality, white has weakened their kingside squares. And now, when white castles later on, their king will no longer be safe. So making a couple more moves, for example, let's say knight ge7, and castle kingside. And now we see the problem. There is no longer a protective wall in front of white's king. Rather, instead, these pawns allow black to go for their own attack with their own pawn pushes via h5 and f5, and black may safely castle queenside. Additionally, you also run the risk of a sacrifice. Let's say in this position, 
Black's Knight had already been out on f6. Let's say instead of playing bishop to c5, they just went like this and played knight to f6 first. Well, in this scenario, you run the additional risk of black potentially being able to sacrifice for the pawn using either their bishop or their knight. For example, white black could take with knight takes g4, h takes g4, bishop takes g4. And now, this is not a very comfortable position for white. Tactically, it's complicated, and the val validity of such a sacrifice will depend on the specific situation. However, it's an extra risk that the player that's pushing the pawns runs, as the pin is maintained at the cost of three points for two, and the knight is no longer supported by a pawn, which is a factor that must be taken into account. Black can now add to the pressure, for example, with moves knight to d4 and queen to f6, attacking this pin knight. And of course, the queen cannot break the pin, as it's the only piece defending the piece that is pinned. Alright, now let's go over some puzzles to see what you've learned. We'll go over the following opening position after the following series of moves. d4, d5, c4. This is known as the queen's gambit. Black declines the gambit with the move e6. Knight to c3, knight f6. Now bishop g5, and knight bd7. This is a fairly common position, and in this position, one of white's options is to play the move bishop takes f7. Or rather, bishop takes f6, sorry. Capturing black's knight. In order to not be down material, black must recapture the bishop, but they have three ways of doing so. The first is capturing with the knight, the second is with the queen, and the third is with the pawn. Which capture is correct? Think about the principles of chess, and also think about what to avoid. Pause the video if you need to, take your time, and unpause when you're ready. Okay, hopefully you've responded that the correct capture is the capture with the knight on d7. Let's analyze all three captures to see why. Let's start with the pawn capture. The pawn capture's primary disadvantages are that it creates doubled pawns, which is a concept that we'll go over later, but more relevant to what we've learned, it doesn't advance any of our opening principles. We haven't developed any pieces, we've very barely helped control the center, and most importantly, this bodes very badly for black trying to castle later on, as black's king on the king side would be castling into an open file, and black's king castling on the queen side might be walking into a row of very far forward pawns that would be able to attack its defenses. Similarly, taking with the queen is also incorrect. Queen takes f6 here violates the principle that we should not be bringing out the queen too early. The queen here actually blocks black's knight in further going towards the center as well. And of course, therefore, our correct capture is knight takes f6. This move frees up space for the bishop to develop, brings the knight closer to the center, and doesn't add any of the weaknesses that we discussed previously, such as making it harder to castle or bringing the queen out too early. Alright, good job if you got that, and let's move on to the next puzzle. For our next puzzle, we'll be going over a line from a famous game called Morphy versus a Duke and a Count. Paul Morphy was a very famous player back in the 1800s. He was one of the prodigies of the time, and he was very advanced in his chess knowledge compared to other contemporaries. This game began e4, e5, knight f3, d6. Note that d6 blocks black's bishop. Now d4, bishop g4. d takes e5. Now black violates another principle of moving the same piece twice and goes bishop takes f3. Queen takes f3, pawn takes e5, bishop c4. Black must defend against the threats. Knight f6, Morphy plays queen b3, creating a fork on b7 and f7. Queen e7 was played. Now, there are tactical reasons why white does not want to capture on b7 that I won't go into here, but 
Morphe decides instead to develop a piece and protect the e4 pawn and goes knight c3. Now c6 is a discovered defense of the b7 pawn. And now bishop to g5. In this position, the duke and count thought and decided to play the move pawn to b5. As we know, this is a mistake because this is a side pawn push in the opening, which is not optimal. How can white take advantage of this? Pause the video, think if you need to, and unpause when you're ready. Hopefully you realized that one of the reasons why such a pawn push is risky is because it opens up the ability of sacrifice. And that is exactly what Paul Morphy did with the move knight takes b5. Black cannot retaliate by capturing the pawn on e4 because the knight is pinned to the queen. So there's only c takes b5 and bishop takes b5 check. Notice that the king is still in the center because of all the mistakes made in the opening. The king cannot castle in either direction. Black's only real option is to either move the king or play knight b to d7 to block. But now we see what a terrible position black is in. Both of their knights are pinned and completely immobile. Black's bishop is blocked by their own queen. Black was completely paralyzed and Morphy was able to continue developing their pieces and eventually, and very quickly rather, won the game with a brilliant checkmate. And I highly encourage you to look up this game for yourself if you're interested. Our final puzzle is less of a puzzle and more of a thought experiment. One very popular opening at the mid-level is called the Grunfeld defense. It goes d4, g6, c4, knight f6, knight c3, d5, and now the main line goes c takes d5, knight takes d5, e4, knight takes c3, b takes c3, and bishop to g7. By the basic opening principles, this appears to be dominant for white. White has complete control of the center, very easy development of pieces, and will quickly castle. Black, on the other hand, has not placed the bishop on any of the normal squares, but instead has placed the bishop on g7. However, this is still a fine position for white, for black. Why, despite placing the bishop very far from the center, is this still fine for black? This is a puzzle to take home and think about. Despite not directly controlling the center, what advantages does black have that allow him to salvage a mostly even position in this situation? Good luck with that, and I'll see you all next week.